I'm going to have to start completely again because the um, computer for some reason switched off. So I apologise for that. So I'm going to begin with chapter 6, Hugo Hamilton, The Speckled People. A wonderful book, thoughtful and compelling, smart and original, beautifully written, said Nick Hornby. The most gripping book I have read in ages. Fascinating, disturbing and often very funny, said Roddy Doyle. An extraordinary achievement. Wonderful, subtle, problematic and humane book. It is about Ireland as well as about a particular family. But it is also about alternatives and complexities anywhere, said George Surtees of the Irish Times. This story about a battle over language and defeat in the language wars is also a victory that eloquent writing, crafty and cunning in its apparent simplicity, said Hermione Lee of the Guardian. Hamilton's first masterpiece to read The Speckled People is to remember why great writing matters. A book for our times, and probably all times, said Joseph O'Connor of the Daily Mail. In one of the finest memoirs to have emerged from Ireland in many years, the acclaimed novelist Hugo Hamilton brings alive his German-Irish childhood in 1950s Dublin between his father's strict Irish nationalism and the softly spoken stories of his mother's German past. This little boy tells the tale of a whole family's homesickness for a country and a language they can call their own. So here we will begin now, chapter six. Inside our house is a warm country with a cake in lovely. My mother makes everything better with cakes and stories and hugs that crack your bones. When everybody is good, my father buys pencil cases with six coloured pencils inside, all sharpened to a point. I draw a picture of the fox with blood around his nose, and Franz draws a picture of the house with everybody in separate rooms. Vatty, Mutty, Franz, Hanny and Maria, all standing at different windows and waving. Ain has gone away to London. The O'Neills have gone away too, so there's no chopping wood and no English and everybody in our house is in the same country saying the same words again. It is Sunday and there's a smell of polish on the floor. There's a smell of baking and ironing and polish all over the house because Uncle Ted is coming for tea. Uncle Ted is my father's brother, a Jesuit priest, and he comes to visit us after his swim at the 40 foot. His hair is still wet and combed in lines. He once saved my father's life, long before he was a priest, when they were still at school and used to go swimming down in Glandor not far from where they lived. My father started drowning one day, so his younger brother had to jump in in his shirt to rescue him. Afterward, my father couldn't speak because he was shivering for a long time. But we don't talk about that now. Uncle Ted can speak German too, but he doesn't say very much. And my mother says he is not afraid of silence. So he listens instead and nods his head. I tell him that Franz has shadows around his eyes because he fell off the wall and broke his nose. 
but my mother says, we won't talk about that now. My mother is trying to prove how decent and polite the Germans are. An uncle is trying to prove how decent and polite the Irish are. And then it's time to reach into his jacket pocket for the bag of sweets and we can have two each and no more. Outside our house is a different place. One day, my mother let us go down to the shop on our own, but she gave us a piece of rope and told us all to hold on to it so we would not get separated. An old woman stopped and said that was a great way of making sure we didn't get lost. My mother says, we are surrounded by old women. Miss Tarleton, Miss Tomlinson, Miss Leonard, Miss Brown, Miss Russell, Miss Hosford, two Miss Rhymes, two Miss Doyles, two Miss Lanes, Mrs. Robinson, Mrs. M. McSweeney and us in between them all. Some are friendly and some hate us. Some of them are Protestant and others are Catholic. The difference is that the Protestant bells make a song and the Catholic bells only make the same gong all the time. You have to be careful where you kick your ball because if it goes into Miss Tarleton's garden next door, you will never get it back. She told us not to dare put a foot in her garden. Mrs McSweeney is nice and calls you in for a Yorkshire toffee. The two Miss Lanes across the road have a gardener who wanted to give you back the ball. One day, he couldn't came to the gate, ready to hand it back. But then, one of the Miss Lanes appeared at the window. And shook her head. The gardener stood there, not knowing what to do. He begged him please to give it back quickly before she came out, but he couldn't because he was working for Miss Lane, not for us. And she was already at the door saying, give that ball here. She said she was going to confiscate it. We stood at the railings until Miss Lane said, clear off, away from the railings, go on about your business now. My mother laughs and says, confiscate does not mean kill or stab with a knife. It just means taking control of something that belongs to somebody else. One day, I confiscated my brother's cars and threw them over the back of the wall into Miss Leonard's garden, but we got them back. One day, Miss Tarleton declared a football amnesty and we got nine balls back, some of which never even belonged to us in the first place and most of which were confiscated all over again very shortly after that. Miss Tarleton might as well have handed them straight over to Miss Lanes. My mother wants to know if the Miss Lanes play football in the kitchen at night and she wants to know what the Miss Lanes have against her because they just slam the door in her face. My mother says maybe they still hate Germany, but my father says they hate their own country even more. He says they still think they're living in Britain and they can't bear the sound of children speaking German on the street and even worse, Irish. My mother says that means we have to be extra nice to them so they don't feel left out. You have to try. 
not to throw rockets up so high because the bang frightens old women and makes them think the Easter rising is coming back again. You have to make sure that the ball does not go into their garden. My father says, it is your own fault if you use the ball because their garden is their country and you can't go in there. He says, our country is divided into two parts, north and south, like two gardens. He says, six counties in the north have been confiscated and are still controlled by the British. The difference between one country and another is the song they sing at the end of the night in the cinema and the flag they have on the post office and the stamps you lick. When my father was working in the north of Ireland once in a town called Coleraine, he refused to stand up in the cinema because they were playing the wrong song. Some people wanted to put him against the wall and shoot him and then he left his job and came back to his own country where he could speak Irish any time he liked. So you have to be careful what country you kick your ball into and what song you stand up for in the cinema. You can't wave the wrong flag or wear the wrong badges like the red poppies with the black dot in the middle. You have to be careful who to be sad for and who not. Commemorate people who died on the wrong side. My father also likes to slam the front door from time to time and he is the best at slamming doors because he makes the whole house shake. Lots of things rattle. Clocks and glasses and cups shiver all the way down to the end of the street. When my father answers the door, he sends a message all over the world, depending on who knocked. If it's the old woman with the blanket who says, God bless you, mister, and promises to pray for him and all his family. If it's the man who sharpens the garden shears on the big wheel, or if it's somebody collecting for the missions, then he gives them money and closes the door gently. If it's people selling carpets, he shakes his head and closes the door firmly. If it's two men in suits with Bibles, then he slams it shut to make sure not even one of their words enters into the hall. And if it's one of the people selling poppies, he slams it shut so fast that the whole street shakes. Sometimes the door slams shut in great anger of its own accord. But that's only because the back door has been left open and there's a draft going through the house. One day, Mr. Cullen, across the street, asked us to help him wash his car. Afterwards, he gave us a whole chocolate bar each because he works for Cadbury's and has boxes and boxes of chocolate bars and trigger bars in the boot of his car all the time. A woman came along the street selling the red badges with the black dot in the middle. So as well as the chocolate, he bought us each a badge and pinned them to our jumpers. Lots of people on the street were wearing them. Miss Tarleton, Mrs. Robinson, Miss Hosford and the two Miss Lanes. We didn't know they were wrong. We didn't know that wearing the wrong badge was like singing the wrong song in the cinema. So when my father saw us coming into the house wearing poppies, he slammed the door and all the clocks and cups and saucers shivered. Fant shivered too. My father ripped the poppies off so fast 
that he stabbed his own finger with the pin and I thought the badge was bleeding. He ran into the kitchen, opened the door of the boiler and threw the badges into the fire. Then he ran his finger under the tap and looked for a plaster while the badges burned nothing. And I thought it was a big waste because Mr. Cullen had paid money for them. Who gave you those damn things? My father wanted to know. Not like that, my mother said. They don't understand. Who gave you those poppies? I could see my father hated even saying the word. They are British Army poppies. Who gave them to you? Mr. Cullen. Mr. Cullen has no right. I'm going to have a word with him. But my mother pulled on his elbow again. She told him that Mr. Cullen's father died in the First World War and we didn't want to offend him. My father said, Mr. Cullen was trying hard to offend us. Lots of good people died on the German side too, as well as the Irish people who died fighting against the British army instead of joining in with them. And what about all the people who died in the famine? And there are no budges you can get for them. Mr. Cullen was mocking us, he said, giving us the poppies on purpose because the Germans lost the war and the Irish lost the six counties. My mother says she's not offended and Mr. Cullen is too nice a man to even think of something like that. It's time to be big-hearted, she says. It's not important to win and one day they will commemorate all the people who died in those wars, not just their own. They have no children, she said. I was afraid that my father would find out he got chocolate and that would go in the fire too. One day, when we were coming home from the shop with Smarties, France dropped one of them on the street and my mother told him to leave it there because it was dirty. Then he threw the rest of the Smarties on the ground as well. If one was dirty, then they must all be dirty. So I thought this was the same. We had brought home something from outside on the street that was dirty. Never let me see those things again, my father warned. Explain it to them, for God's sake, my mother said. She doesn't like things being taken away from us without something else put in its place. She wants everything to be explained in a calm way, sitting down. So my father sits at the table. We sit opposite him. And he tells us why we can't accept poppies from anyone. First of all, he says there was the British Empire. He takes out a map of the world and points to all the pink bits that were owned by the British. Then he says the Germans wanted to have an empire too. But the British did not like the idea. So that was the First World War. He says millions of men died when two empires fought against each other and not even one person was killed on their own soil. It was big countries squabbling over little countries. Then right in the middle of it all, the Irish decided to declare their own free state. We serve neither king nor kaiser is what the Irish were saying to themselves and to all the other small countries around the world. But after that, it is hard to understand what my father is saying anymore because my mother's name was Kaiser and I don't know what the difference is between the First World War and the Second World War and who the Nazis are and what they have to do with us. My mother says the Germans hardly behaved any better than the British, that instead of just having an empire and keeping slaves, the Nazis made slaves of their own people. Germans turned themselves into slaves and started killing all the other people who were not German enough. And my father says it's all the same thing. That is the end of the road.
he says. And I think there are people being killed at the end of the road and I don't want to go down there anymore. My father says, all we need to know is that poppies are not allowed in the house and that is the end of the story. We will get our own badges and flags and songs on St. Patrick's Day. We get shamrock and green badges and tricoloured jelly and ice cream. At night in bed, I'm afraid of silence. I can see the light coming under the door and I think my father still wants to go over Mr. Cullen. Mr. Cullen, only that my mother is holding him back, telling him to leave it. It is all in the past. We are in the future and we have to behave like the future. Then I hear the music coming up from the front room. Big German music spreading all over the house again, all the way up the stairs and in under the door with the light. On Sunday, Uncle Ted comes to tea again with his hair combed in lines. I tell him all about the balls that Miss Tarleton gave back, but the Miss Lanes took away again. I tell him that we were allowed to wash Mr. Cullen's car and that we got chocolate. I tell him about the poppies and all the people being killed at the end of the road. But my mother says, we won't talk about that now. I tell him that a man on the bus said, Nazi, to my mother under his breath. But we won't talk about that either. Then it's time to reach into Uncle, Uncle Ted's pocket for the sweets. I don't know what to tell or not to talk about anymore. After that, it is hard to know what is right and wrong. My mother says, we have started doing a lot of things that make no sense. One day, Franz put stones in his ears and he couldn't hear anything anymore. Maria put a marrow fat pea in her nose and it swelled up so much that the doctor had to come and take it out. Franz hit his thumb with a hammer and his finger went blue. Then I started burying all the silver spoons in the garden with my grandfather's initial F K written on them and my mother had to find the treasure. She laughs and says she hopes we don't do any more stupid things for a while. But then one day I started throwing the toy cars in the fire. I carried the box with all my cars into the kitchen and opened the door of the boiler myself. I could see them lying on top of the orange coals. I watched them lighting up blue and green for a moment until the flames disappeared and they went black and silver. One by one, I threw my cars on top of the coals until my mother came and asked me if I was out of my mind. She pulled me away and slammed the door of the boiler shut. She kneeled down and looked straight into my eyes. She makes everything better with hugs that break your bones. She tells me a story and says, it's all forgotten now and we won't talk about it anymore. So that is the end of chapter six. So good night and God bless and we look forward to hearing chapter seven next time. Bye bye.